and welcome to the Software Engineering Unlocked podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Michaela, and today I have the pleasure to talk to Afti Grimm. But before I start, let me tell you a little bit about my latest project, awesomecodereviews.com. Yeah, all my work on code reviews has now its own dedicated home. At awesomecodereviews.com, at awesomecodereviews.com, you find articles about code reviews best practices, code review checklists, news about the latest research on code reviews, and of course, all my courses and workshops uh, that I offer around this topic. So please hop over to awesomecodereviews.com and check out my latest work. But now back to Afti. Afti has been a developer for over 20 years and runs, similar to me, a training and consultant business. The main difference is that he has been doing this already for over 10 years. So I'm super thrilled to pick his brain today around everything business related. He's also a consulting bear programmer and the author of several popular Ruby uh, programming books and has several courses on, on this subject on his website, raceful.dev, formerly rubletuppers.com. So I'm super thrilled that he's here with me today. Uh, Abdi, welcome to my show. I'm, I'm very excited. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm super excited. So I've been following your journey on Twitter and so on for quite some time. Very inspirational as well. Um, and I have a lot of questions uh, around how you run your business and, and why you're running the business and, um, and, and what we can learn from you, right? The uh, seasoned uh, entrepreneur and self-employed uh, person um, to also maybe get a little bit more independence in our life, right? So this is uh, probably the main goal for myself, <laughs> for everything that I do is flexibility and, and independence. Um, why are you running your own business and uh, how does this come about? Why are you not the software developer at the company somewhere? Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, to some degree, I feel like it's almost an inevitable career arc for somebody in software. Um, I'm, you know, I know people who have who have avoided it, but uh, a lot of the people that I kind of looked up to over the years uh, went through some, you know, they, they went through the, the full time employment phase and then they gradually kind of moved out to becoming consultants um, and having various um, other side businesses. Um, and I don't, you know, come to think of it, I never really thought about this bef much before, but, um, I had the example of my dad who was, um, who worked in software and, uh, and hardware design, and he was an independent consultant when I was growing up. So that was kind of normalized to me to like, have your own thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. For me, so it was quite different. I, yeah. I, I think that I, I saw that on the horizon, maybe from earlier than some people do just because it was, it was normalized mm -hmm. for me. Um, you know, and it just seemed like, you know, that's what, that's what a lot of my heroes, heroes did in the industry was eventually they became consultants. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. If you have like role models for me, it was quite the difference. Um, my, I always thought that I will, you know, work at the company for a really long time and, you know, climb the career ladder somewhere <laughs> and there. And, um, and it only even, actually I started a family that I saw well, this is not working out as I expected and as I would like it to work out, right? And so this was a little bit why I, why I changed uh, the thing. So you call it a banana stand. Um, you don't call it like an, an enterprise or <laughs> <laughs> something. Why do you call it a banana yeah. stand? And, and what's your philosophy for your business? Um, how do you run it? So, yeah, I've started using the term banana stand recently, especially as I've been kind of reflecting back on, you know, uh, over, over a decade of doing this. and. Um, like my style of, of running the business and writing up, writing a little bit more about that. The, the term banana stand, it comes from uh, the show Arrested Development in which um, one of the characters uh, says to another who is, the, the, this character is trying to save the family business and, and his, his dad who is in prison keeps telling him there's always money in the banana stand, um, which he completely misinterprets the message and winds up burning down a banana stand that's that's full of literal money in the um, in the walls. Um, I apologize if I've spoiled the show for you, but it's it's been out, been out for a while. Um, but uh, but you know, like that that phrase stuck with me. There's always money money in the banana stand, and that's kind of the way that I look at it. Um, I mean, so there's kind of two sides to this this independent business. Um, for me, there's the, there's the consulting side and then there's the product side, um, product being kind of a broad term for selling books, selling courses, 
selling workshops. Um, it's kind of a loose definition of product, but it's definitely distinct from from the the consulting side of of my business, which is more like you know hourly consulting on people's projects. And and I definitely look at the product side as a banana stand, as like something that uh, I kind of run casually. Uh, even if I'm putting all, most of my time into it now, I still run it kind of like uh, lazily. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and it's it's my own banana stand to putter around in. I'm not like, you know, beholden to any like schedules. And I'm not on any kind of like track of I have to, you know, make this much money. I have to like, you know, pay my make sure that my VCs get a, a payoff and stuff like that. There's It's just kind of like, you know, I get to putter around in the banana, banana stand and, and work on whatever I feel like. Um, and, and the, you know, that, that phrase, there's always money in the banana stand is kind of like that has, has, has informed the way I think about employment a lot, because for me, if I'm in between jobs, as I I used to think of it as in between jobs, I don't think of it that way anymore. But if I'm in between jobs, quote unquote, um, that's not like a time to panic and, you know, and like do all the interviews and, and freak out about how I'm unemployed. That's time to just focus on the banana stand. Mm -hmm. Um, and until something comes along that makes sense. And I think that's, that's been helpful to have that. Um, and, um, yeah, that side of my business really like, so that we talked about consulting, but that side really came from, from early on, um, getting into books, ebook sales, Mm -hmm. Um, which we can talk about, um, how that got started if you want. So if I understand that, um, you would say there's the consulting, which is, you know, it's something that you have continuously to invest in. Um, and you, you know, you also make some contracts around that. I'm also doing some consulting, which means like now I'm dedicating, let's say 30 hours for this project for three months. Right. And so, um, you are more or less (laughs) sold out for that time. Um, but it's it kind of like a real job. Yeah, it's like a real job. Yeah, uh, only that you have all the risk as well. <laughs> Which, uh, it's even worse. But it's, you know, <laughs> it, 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 but it, it, there's a lot more. Even even there, there's a lot more independence. And honestly, you know, one of the things that I value in the on the the consulting side is that, I mean, yeah, you have the risk, but there's always the risk. There's you know, there's there are no guarantees in this industry. There are no no you know guaranteed retirement plans. And what I don't have to do is I don't have to buy into a lot of corporate mission and values BS that I don't believe in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have your consultancy and then in between those consultancy gigs, right? Uh, When there are no consultancy gigs, you're not freaking out. You're working on your banana stand and you grow that, right? And, and, And the good thing is about the products and, you know, this, this mindset, I think, is that even a little bit of work on them pays off, right? So it's a little bit like investment. Um, so yeah. you create another free course maybe, and you have like a, you know, a good lead magnet, have people that are interested in your work. Um, then you create, you know, a paid course when you have time and so on. And, and it, it, it stays, right. It's something that's there for longer, um, whereby the consulting, it comes, it brings normally quite good money <laughs> from my experience, right. In a very short amount of time, but then it right. goes away as well, where the banana stand maybe is a little bit it's not this boom. Now you have like all this money, uh, but it's also not it's going a snowball. away, right? Yeah, exactly. It's a snowball. It's a flywheel somehow, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, a consulting gig is, is one big blizzard that, you know, that melts the next week. Yeah. And, and uh, a banana stand is a snowball that you just kind of gr- gradually roll over the years. And so how long did it take for you to have this banana stand where you could say, well, I have some predictable income that, you know, makes me sleep at night. <laughs> Very yeah. Quickly. Um, so actually I think, you know, my trajectory there probably was a little different from a lot of people's um, because I, I kind of, you know, I puttered along having the, the book, the ebook business on the side for a few years. And that, that really just fell out of, um, out of speaking. Um, mm-hmm. That was a, it, it, it happened because I was, um, I was giving talks uh, at software conferences. And I was pouring a ton of time and energy into researching these talks. And I was like, you know, I wonder if there's a way to kind of recoup. Um, you know, I have all this material that I put together. Uh, I can't fit it all into a talk. And I wonder if there's a way to like recoup the the energy that I've been putting into this. And that was really the origin of the first book, which is exceptional Ruby. Mm -hmm. Um, and which is about, um, 
uh, error handling and failure management. And, and I made a, a book out of like the, all the, you know, extra material that I put together for that. And that was that kind of launched things. And so that was kind of a side business. It was a nice little side business um, for a couple of years. And then what changed was I decided to get into screencasting. Mm hmm. Um, I'd been doing the books, I'd been doing some podcasting, and um, this was around, you know, this is like 20, maybe 2010, 2011, um, 2012, I, um, a lot of screen programming screencasts started um, taking off. Mm -hmm. And I decided to get into that business. And I had a vision of like, uh, what if we did that only like much more, sh much shorter and more focused mm -hmm. and, you know, just do like five minutes or less one, you know, get one idea across at a time. And so that was unlike most banana stand efforts, that was really like a do or die, kind of, not do or die. I don't like that terminology. That was a go big or go home. That's the word I'm, the phrase I'm looking for, go big or go home. Um, because I knew how much energy went into, um, video production and it is a lot. And so it was like, okay, this is a project that I'm going to test the waters. If it does well, I'm going to try, you know, the only way this works is if I can make it into my full-time full, full job. Otherwise, I'll just stop. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, I got really lucky. Um, I was coming in at a good time. Um, people really liked the format. And um, so within, I think, around a year or two, um, I, was, I was able to say, I don't actually need other jobs right now. Uh, with the Ruby Tapas uh, screencasts. Oh, yeah, that's um, nice. That was kind of like line goes up. That was less, you know, slowly rolling snowball. Yeah. And how much time did you spend in this uh, line goes up phase? Um, you know, because somehow when you're focusing on something, um, like let's doing the screencasts, uh, you're not having an income, right? And then if you go yeah. to consulting, you don't have a time. <laughs> so you have to switch between those modes of not having time or not having money. So how did you handle that at that time? I didn't sleep. <laughs> I had at least one new baby at the time too. And like, I was working consulting gigs. I don't know. It's kind of a blur Yeah. at this point. Uh, I, I don't think that I could do that kind of thing again, yeah. unless it was a great need. Um, yeah. it, Cause I was also at that point I, at, at the beginning, I was producing three episodes a week. Um, wow, and, yeah. that's a lot. um, yeah, I was doing a lot at once and it was kind of nuts. Yeah. And I actually really liked, so with the whole style also, when I look through your blog posts and everything, right, you have your own style. You, you didn't call it like professional Ruby screencast. You called it Ruby tapas, right? And the tapas probably transport the message of it's, you know, small, pieces of very digestible, yeah. <laughs> tasty things, right? Yeah. I mean, I feel like some of that probably also fell out of just like the, the Ruby, like, like minds that the, the community has always been super whimsical okay. um, and kind of silly. And so, you know, I, I can't take full credit for that approach. Yeah. And so, um, but recently, I don't know exactly when, um, but you, you rebranded your whole Ruby Tapas into Graceful Death. Why yes. is that? Um, it, for me, it seems like it's now broader and there can be more mm -hmm. happening. Um, but what's your strategic uh, vision behind, you know, <laughs> going from Ruby I Tapas? I do, to man, Grace I do not do <laughs> strategic visions. Um, I used to. Yeah. Um, but man, I avoid strategy uh, as much as possible now. Um, I mean, that's okay. That's not true. I do a little. I do a little, but you definitely have I some reasoning not, behind it, right? So. I try not to have five year goals. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, I don't do goals. Uh, there's definitely some reasoning there. There's a direction there. I mean, the, the, the direction was, was one that I've honestly had in the back of my mind for a really long time. Um, a lot of people don't know that like the same day in like 2011 or whenever it was that I, that I registered Ruby .com, and associated addresses. I also registered codetapas.com. Okay. Um, so like, you know, I, I, I never like wanted to completely limit myself to Ruby, strictly Ruby content. Um, you know, I've, I've worked in God, like a dozen languages over the course of my career. Um, and, uh, Ruby was just an area that I, that I wound up focusing on a lot and wound up making a lot of money in. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and enjoying, I really, really enjoy the language still and, and the community as well. 
Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I always, I, I always had in the back of my mind, you know, that I would expand. Um, but you know, I didn't. I wound up not using, as you'll notice, I wound up not using Code Tapas as the as the branding because I was really like moving in a different direction, um, broadening not just in like not just in the technologies that I want to cover, but also I just spend a lot more of my time thinking about broader topics like, you know, the su sustainability of the development that we do and systems thinking, understanding the systems in which we work and the systems that, that cause the work that we have to exist. Um, and yeah, so just for a lot of reasons, it made more sense to me. Um, and in some of my talks, I've been really focusing on the concept of grace. Uh, so it just made more sense to me to, to move in that that branding direction. And then recently I had the opportunity to finally like do a lot of the heavy lifting of of moving content over. And so I took that. And why? Where did this opportunity come from? Well, so I, I hit a point a few years back where I was like, okay, you know what? I've been sort of off on my own, doing my own thing for a long time. Um, I would like to, I would like to get back into like the 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 hustle and bustle of being part of a big team that's making something real in the world and i spent i don't know a year or so um interviewing pretty seriously at a bunch of different places and uh, that did not go as as expected and i finally decided that um i wasn't going to focus on that af anymore after all and i was just going to get back to the banana stand because there's always money in the banana stand mm -hmm. um and and that has been uh actually an immensely satisfying experience kind of coming back to it with a fresh, fresh, like maybe this is my calling perspective. Yeah. I actually followed uh, this journey a little bit on, on, on your Twitter. You were sharing it with, with us <laughs> and uh, also the hassle of the whole, you know, <laughs> getting naked in front of <laughs> um, strangers, you know, and really selling yeah. yourself. And I mean, you have been in the industry for so long you have been doing, you know, you have sharing, you have shared your learning, um, you know, you have some, some portfolio online. It's not like somebody comes and has no idea about you, but still it felt like at least what I got out of your tweets, right? What I read into them was that every interview was a little bit, it wasn't really like keeping your dignity, right? So you had really yeah. to get naked in front of them to do all these silly things and, you know... You know, I wouldn't... I, I actually, I would argue that yeah. it's not... It wasn't really about being naked. It wasn't really being about being transparent. It was about people wanting you to do a very special dance for them mm -hmm. that, okay. that strokes their ego. And me being at a point in my career and life where I'm just like, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Why would I do that? Looking back, I got some actually really nice offers from some, some really, you know, well, large companies anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, but in the end I was not comfortable taking any of them, yeah. uh, just because, uh, in, and, and in part because of what I saw during the, um, the interview process. Okay. What did you see? Um, well, you know, so actually let me tell you about something I just heard recently, uh, from a friend of mine, uh, because I, I hear the same story over and over again. Like my story what I've realized is my story is, is not at all unique. Mm -hmm. um, so just the other day, I heard the story again of like basically, you know, a extremely senior, um, well-respected, brilliant engineer gets asked to buy a friend that works at a fang, you know, works at one of these giant unicorn uh, Silicon Valley darlings, gets asked to come interview there. It's like, we'd love, you know, I'd love to ha work with you here, um, which is basically what happened to me mm -hmm. uh, in a number of different places. And they get, you know, so they kind of go into the interview silo um, and then they go through this process where in, you know, in this particular case, like they got interviewed by someone who was totally unrelated to the group that wanted to hire them. Yeah. Um, because this is the way the process works. You know, we don't want bias in the system. It, there's a lot in, in these processes that are that's supposedly about eliminating bias and it's actually creating it. Uh, we can talk about that more in a minute, but was interviewed by, by someone totally unrelated to that team. Um, and basically they were like, you know, show that, you know, by heart, my favorite al algorithm. Yeah. Bubble sort. <laughs> you know, I happen to have a favorite algorithm. You're going to show me that you can, you can identify that I'm thinking of this algorithm and then you can write it by heart. 
Uh, yeah. um, and, and like that wasn't an algorithm that this engineer had used before. And so it wasn't one that they, they, they thought of, you know, I've got a lot of stuff in my background where it's like, I know of algorithms that probably most engineers haven't heard of because they happen to be useful for networking middlewares. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and I hear this all the time. Anyway, they got flunked out because they couldn't, you know, reproduce somebody's favorite algorithm from by heart. And this is somebody with like <sighs> close to my level of experience. Um, it's, it's nuts. And I keep hearing this. It's actually, um, you know, I've heard this from a lot of people with my, a lot of friends of mine with my level of, of experience in the industry that these systems are really tuned to find people that are exactly like the found, like exactly like the people who designed the system mm -hmm. in as many ways as possible. Yeah. Um, and like for me, I don't care. Um, I am, I am a white guy with plenty of opportunities and a banana stand. You know, I can, I can fall out of a process like that and be fine. Um, but what I'm seeing is that these processes are also, I mean, they're very gatekeepy and they're very cliquey. They're very in crowd. They're very, very like we are expecting people that sort of show the the secret insignia of a very select group of silicon valley insiders basically yeah uh, i think one of the problems is also that they they often require a tremendous amount of preparation right and if you think you are an experienced engineer maybe at that point you have a family for example around right and some other yeah. commitments it gets really hard to study some, you know, lead code examples uh, just to be as fast as, you know, somebody else, right? And, and I think right. this is also something that I criticize a lot where I'm thinking. And then you don't even need that, you know, <laughs> you don't need that knowledge. You could really solve real world problems. You have some experience, some background, right, that you have worked on. And it's probably also super challenging. So looking really at what that person has already achieved in the last, let's say, 15 years, um, right uh, would be you know and, and then really let them explain that in in depth which shows that they probably can learn you know whatever problem or solve whatever problem you throw at them um would right. be a much better way than you know getting back to bubble sword and you know <laughs> and, and right. link list and, or something right uh, and and this this is a big part of where the bias is in the system and this is why i get sort of morally outraged by it you know I don't do well in these, you know, I, I might not do well in these because I'm at a point where I just can't be arsed to do that much, that much, uh, homework of like learning somebody's arbitrary favorite algorithm. Um, but you know, when, what they're implicitly biasing towards is the, the sort of stereotypical young white dude that has all the time in the world and doesn't have a family to support and doesn't have any disabilities and, you know, I could, I could list off a yeah. lot of, you know, a whole lot of privileges there that go into that sort of, they're really looking for that person who has nothing else going on in their life. Exactly. Um, yeah. you know, that be, so that they can then like induct them into the cult of your passion is your, is your software career. Yeah. Um, and, and that bugs the heck out of me. Um, you know, and I see this really like, you know, who it's really hurting is people that come from non, you know, from backgrounds that aren't like mine. Um, and, um, and have other stuff. They have people that they're taking care of. They have kids, they have elderly parents, they have families that they're sending money to, and they can't afford a, you know, a break in their income while they spend six months playing the, you know, doing nothing but the interview game. Um, they have, you know, there are so many things, you know, and, and the people that, that are, um, you know, so many mi minorities in this country already have, um, well in the world, uh, or, you know, minoritized people, I should say, uh, have so many other calls on their time because of the way society's already stacked against them that that it it makes it impossible to to jump through these hoops. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. Yeah. So no. <laughs> um I want to come back Sorry, I get a little bit to your banana stand this. again because this is uh, the way out for <laughs> for you and it's a little bit the way out for me as well, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, with yeah. Graceful Dev, I don't know if you had that before. Yeah. You had Ruby Tapas and you had like the courses, but Great Graceful Dev is now a full-fledged membership site, right? So you have different courses um, and, and you build it on top of WordPress. 
um, why why did, did you go this route? I mean, you could have like your courses on some third party platform, right? Um, you know, from I don't know Teachable or what you know many many different Podia and so on. What there are, um, but you host it yourself, and then you have the, the membership side as well. And you do that. Um, why this choice? Like, I'm, I'm also thinking about right now, um, awesomecodereviews.com, for example, runs on. <laughs> I, I switched from WordPress uh, to mm-hmm. uh, to Gatsby. So it's a static site. Okay. And I'm mm-hmm. thinking on, you know, how to give it a membership um, capabilities. And I looked at Circle CI and so on. But why did you go for WordPress? Um, and are you happy with it? And what's the what's the philosophy behind what do people get from this membership um what do you want to build um probably there's a community behind right and some yeah um some wishes you know this you is this is that. a this is a, a, a an opinion i've kind of come to over years of of using many different systems um yeah and there's there's a continuum here because you know a lot of a lot of people running particularly running uh, education sites for developers have rolled their own uh, system from scratch. They've built their own um, their own servers their, or mm-hmm. their, own, their own applications. Um, and so, you know, there's that, that continuum all, all the way from roll your own to, you know, use a completely hosted service like a, a Kajabi, a Podia, a, mm-hmm. you know, think, uh, Thinkific, whatever, uh, Teachable. Um, you know, and I've, I've tried a lot of these different things. I, I started out on somebody else's platform. I started Ruby Tapas out on somebody else's platform. Um, and it was super limiting, you know, there, there would be things that, that people were asking for for years and they just, that feature wasn't a priority for the platform. Um, cause you're competing, you know, you're competing with all the other people who use the platform. Um, and for, you know, whose, whose feature is most important. And, um, so it was very limiting to use a plat, a hosted platform. Um, and I've uh, periodically, I try them again and they're always, there's always like something pretty early on. It's like, wow, I really need this feature and I don't have it. Um, but I've also toyed with building my own. Um, I did that for a few years and you know, what I realized was if I did that, my show was going to become about building an app to support the show. Uh, because I would, that's what I was going to be spending all my time on. Um, cause it's a lot of work to build. It's a lot of work, yeah. There's, there, people don't realize, you know, how many features are expected in an application that sells content and, and serves content and keeps track of people's progress in the content, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and yeah, I just, that was not the show that I wanted to, to be doing was, you know, I didn't want to be like, here's videos about how to build a place that hosts these videos. Mm-hmm. So um, R- WordPress has turned out to be a really happy medium kind of between those two extremes. Um, WordPress is just incredibly mature software. I know like a lot of people, there's a lot of people in particularly the developer world that are kind of biased against WordPress and, um, sadly against like the, the PHP ecosystem entirely, um, which I think is really undeserved. Um, there's a lot of really, really good people working in this, in this space and, the ecosystem is just amazing because you can kind of build anything you want and you can there you can get as as little or as much support as you want. You know, it's it's easy enough to build your own plugins for WordPress to just do a little tweak here, a little tweak there. Um, it's got a one, you know, the the architecture of it really supports the idea of exposing everything it does as hooks and then you can hook your own stuff into those hooks. Mm-hmm. Um, which is why it has this great plugin ecosystem. But one of the really cool things about the plugin ecosystem around WordPress is A, there is a plugin for everything, like anything you might want to do. Somebody's got a plugin for it. And B, usually they have like a premium version which comes with support. And I have had the best experience with premium plugins for WordPress. Like, you know, people just like being very responsive, developers being very responsive to the people that are giving them money and and coming back and, you know, with bug fixes or like going into the, you know, going into your site and making, figuring out why it's not working. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, so it's, it's like, it's one of the rare places I've seen that people are putting out a ton of open source software, but also getting paid for their work because all these plugins, like the base version, at least is always open source. Um, and then basically you're paying them for maybe some premium features, but mainly for support, for a support contract. And, um, you know, and so people are making their living 
creating open source software. And I think that's pretty cool. And it's also, it also has, has done really well for my business. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so I looked at, at some of your courses, right? And so there are the probably you're hosting your videos, but then there are also mm-hmm. like, um, you know, questionnaires, for example, mm-hmm. some quizzes, you know, as you said, you see that people, you know, it, it somehow tracks the progress of the people. It has right. to know that you're a member, you can access that course, that, the, okay, other yeah. course the other course, all of that functionality. Does it come out of the box with some plugins uh, for WordPress or did you have to um, implement that yourself? Or was it a mixture that you're actually getting a plugin and then you can, you know, um, ex- enhance that, uh, enhance that. With, right. your own code? with your own code? Great question. So um, ba- there are two to three categories of plugins that go into a site like this. I mean, my, my site has a lot more plugins than that, but there's sort of th- maybe three basic pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, and one is, uh, is learning management system, LMS, otherwise known as courseware. Mm-hmm. So that's a category of plugins. I could probably reel off maybe six, six of them off the top of my head. Um, I'm personally using LearnDash, which is the, m- one of the older ones and one of the more, uh, probably the most popular one in, in WordPress right now. Um, and um, it's very mature. Uh, it's it's a little clunky for me sometimes because it's really targeting, in many ways it's targeting like serious learning institutions where they have like accreditation concerns and certificates and like you can't take this course until you take this other course. A lot of stuff that I don't care about. But on the on the flip side, it's very mature. They handle mm-hmm. like all the things that I might want to put into it. They just also also a lot of stuff that I don't care about. Um, and then so you've got like there's learning management. Um, that's one. There's membership, which is like another whole category of plugins. Generally, they which are generally s- focused around given this account, what material does this person have access mm-hmm. to, and that that includes courses. Like, what courses does this person okay. have access to? So but it also extends nice to like together, learn dash and this yeah. Membership. So generally, what you see. So I'm using learn dash on the LMS side. I'm currently using MemberPress, um, which is one of the more popular uh, membership management plugins, um, and they do have a lot of of. Generally, these plugins, they, they work hard to work with each other, you know, different teams usually, but they work hard to work with each other because that's, that's where a lot of the value comes mm-hmm. from. And so they have explicit support for each other. Um, and then the, the third piece often is like your e-commerce, how you sell the thing. Um, and, and that is often a separate plugin as well. Like in the WordPress ecosystem, it's usually WooCommerce. Sometimes it's EDD, e- easy digital, digital downloads. Um, now I've reeled these off like they are distinctly separate categories, but actually everyone in in, almost everyone in each of these spaces will happily give you like all of the above kind of in one, Mm -hmm. um, because they all kind of, they all gradually expand out to include each other's features. So like learn dash, you can do a pretty basic, um, membership management using the groups that are built into learn dash. You can sell courses directly. Like they have Stripe integration and stuff directly from learn dash. If you want to, it's kind of basic, but it's totally there. Mm-hmm. Um, member press recently in- introduced their own course, courseware plugin for member press. So you can just like stick with that company if you want, as long as you're okay with like a more basic mm-hmm. courseware offering. Um, and they also, they also have the storefront part built in if you want to use it. Um, so there's a lot of blur between these plugins as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. And so are you, um, then enhancing that? Is that possible? Especially if you have like the, the, the paid version, could you just, yes. um, write that? And then how do you t- keep, keep track of your own changes and new updates that are coming yeah. from, <laughs> from the team? How do you integrate mm-hmm. those things? Um, so one of the marks of a good, like a, 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 a industrial strength WordPress plugin is that they have well-defined hooks. So, you know, I was talking about like WordPress mm-hmm. is built on the concept of hooks. They have well-defined hooks that are documented. Um, and, um, and so like the ones that I work with do, they have good documentation sites and they have all these hooks that you can like, here's how you change this, you know, here's how you hook your own thing into this particular part of the interface or this particular process. And then, so what I have is what they call a site specific plugin that I keep under version control. And I have a deployment system for that pushes it out to my website. Um, and my site specific plugin basically just very selectively has a few, there's a few hooks where I want to customize something 
in one of those other plugins and it just like hooks its own handler into just the like the very specific hook that that is one tiny piece that i care about changing um it's very small the site specific plugin is very small i try to keep it very small um and very focused okay but so it has a, a well-defined api or hooks that you can really yeah. enhance and you're trying you're not you're not going in and hacking in their <laughs> in their code right. base right so you're you're really on the outside, whatever they allow you to right. change. That's yeah. And if you're going to like really get into this ecosystem, that's one of the things you want to keep your eye out for is like, does it seem like these people are really supporting, um, supporting that kind of external hooks? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. That sounds, um, sounds very interesting. And um, I, I know quite a couple of people that are running WordPress websites and have a lot of, you know, they're like you said, WooCommerce or like mm -hmm. a membership sites and they're very, very happy with it. Um, maybe my my last question for you is um, around. You said you're not going to plan for five years and so on, right? But I think everybody has some some vision, you know, some some reasons why you are doing things like transitioning from Ruby Tapas to Graceful Dev, right? Um, where do you see yourself? Do you want to do like? Is there a possibility that Graceful Dev is really that your full full time thing and that you're not doing any consulting or? Um, do you want to keep doing consulting on the side or, you know, what, you know, where do you, where are you heading towards? What's, what's your ideal case? Um, I wish I had a good answer for you. Um, you know, I, I, I want to keep being able to do what feels right, um, at the time, which is kind of what I'm doing right now. Um, you know, uh, graceful, graceful dev is supporting me pretty decently along, you know, that along, alongside some of my other, you know, other products and things. Um, you know, I take, I take consulting gigs as they, as they look interesting. Yeah. And are you a solopreneur um, or do you have like a team that really helps you? How, how, how is that? Um, oh yeah. Good question. Um, I, I don't have any full-time employees. Um, for years and years I've, I've employed people very part-time. Um, here and there only ever like a handful only ever like maybe three to five at most at any given time um actually five is probably more than i have um but like i have somebody that's where i've worked with for a long time that handles kind of first line of support so the so support emails um first um first go to them and then they escalate them to me mm -hmm. um i have somebody um, i'm working with now who's doing a lot of like helping me with content like doing video editing or um, fixing up, adding, fixing up blog posts that have become like their formatting has gone wonky or is out of date or something like that. Um, yeah. So I have a few people that just like very part-time helpers. Have to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm currently right now in this position of getting people and I find it really difficult <laughs> finding the right people because, you know, if you're ready in this, in this, okay, I need help now. I don't know how you overcame that step, but for me, it's like, I need help now and I can't grow, you know, without this help, but I also can't really make the time to find the right people and to teach them and to onboard them. I'm sorry. Right. I, I find oh, it really yeah. struggling. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that is, that is the, the classic catch 22 and there's no easy way out of it. You know, the, the, the point where you absolutely don't have, like, you don't have the overhead space to train somebody, but you need to train somebody mm -hmm. in order to get the overhead space. I, yeah. I wish I had an easy answer for that one. Like that part's a slog. Yeah, um, and eventually you kind of pull your head above it. Um, but it's hard because yeah, like the, 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 the effort involved in like getting through that catch 22 is, is exhausting. I, I will say this about it. And, and this has informed my work for a long time. Um, this is the most important kind of scaling to plan for. I think a lot of people in software are completely focused on um, either financial scaling or on um, like user scaling, you know, the, your user base scaling mm -hmm. up. Like, are, do we have the, do we, you know, will our code base support um, unicorn scale, raffle scale? <laughs> um, uh, and that's not the most, that is by far like the least common form of scaling that you have to support. The kind of scaling that you need to plan for is devolving stuff from yourself, taking, removing yourself as a bottleneck. That is the most urgent and immediate form of scaling that you're going to face. And so 
one of the reasons I have a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons that I work, use WordPress, um, is because it is the dominant player. Like it is, God, it powers like half the web now. Mm -hmm. Um, and there is this huge ecosystem. And if I need somebody to do like copy editing, I don't need to teach them how to use GitHub and like commit things, you know, I don't need to find a copy editor, but then t teach them how to use my special precious bespoke system. Um, they know how to use WordPress. Yeah. Whoever they are, they know how to use WordPress. Uh, and you know, if I need to get somebody, you know, if I want some help with my site, because I don't have time to, 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 uh, d diagnose one particular bug, it's really easy to find WordPress consultants. Um, and there's just so many things there where, where it's just, it's easy to find people that can do the thing that you need, need help with. And that's just as a general kind of policy, that's one of my biggest considerations when choosing anything is not, you know, not is this going to scale up, but can I scale it away from me? Can, mm -hmm. you know, can I unbottle, you know, remove myself as the bottleneck for this in the future? Yeah. Yeah. That's such a good mindset. And, um, I, I'm currently learning a lot with it and, you know, it, it takes much more time and much more energy than I thought, but mm -hmm. I also see I that, you know, if you have already one person, right. So <laughs> finding this one person, it means that maybe you have to work with six different people and then you realize, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's making more trouble than <laughs> what I'm getting yeah. out of. Yeah. And, and I should say here, like, it, the, the, you know, use my bad example, uh, for learning, uh, I hit a crash at one point. Um, where I really wasn't like I was, my outgo was bigger than my income. And a big piece of that was that I had, um, I had tried to devolve too much of myself. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I tried to become too big and, and pay too many people to do too many different things. And the funny thing about what was happening there was that I was still swamped. I still had too little time. And it was because I had basically, you know, installed myself as a manager and I was spending all of my time, uh, you know, helping people get unstuck yeah, and, and managing things. And so, yeah, it's really easy. Like once you, once you kind of get, start going down that, that, uh, delegation road, it's really easy to go too far. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. And I think so, one step at a time and yeah. And keeping the focus, like I really would like to create more content, have more of this really quality time doing what I love to do, like teaching, thinking about content, writing blog posts, right? This is really what gives me energy and less about right. the administrative stuff. But then, as you say, I have to be very careful not to get people <laughs> that are adding to my administrative stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, but yeah. Um, very, very good. Input. I think it's important yeah. to always know that like you can do the thing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's a, one of my personal policies is like anything that I'm thinking of delegating or, or automating, always do it manually first and do it manually for a while first and get a really good idea of what it is that I'm either delegating or automating. And usually what I discover is that I can automate less of it than I was planning mm -hmm. and it's enough, or I can delegate less of it than I was planning and it's enough. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, um, as it's always very tempting to be like, man, there's this one aspect of my business. I just don't want to think about at all. Yeah. And so I'm just, I just going to, I want to delegate, delegate that part of it. And I think that's really dangerous that that leads down that road of like, now I'm just jammed up managing everyone, um, and paying too much, you know, and, and I'm, you know, not balancing my books. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, that's true. So yeah. I think it's, it's do a... the thing the hard way for a while. Mm -hmm figure out the smallest piece of it that you can automate or delegate. Yeah, cool. So, uh, Abdi, thank you so much for, for sharing all your insights. Is there something like if there are developers out there that think, uh, oh, I would like to have some side hustle, you know, get a little bit more in independence um, mm -hmm. or maybe even uh, go full in. What do you think, what is a, is a good strategy nowadays, um, you know, when there are already so many screencasts and there are already, you know, so many other things, so many blog posts, so many podcasts yeah. and so on what 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 do you think how should people start doing it um is it still is a blog still a good first outlet um there's there's no going wrong with blogging uh it's like, like it really doesn't matter like what your plan is get good at writing about things 
like practice writing. It, it, it just that I feel like that skill has informed that has informed, has improved so many other aspects of my business and of my career. I mean, writing about what you learn is, is such great practice for, even if you just stay a regular developer, you're going to be a better developer because you are better at explaining and documenting your work to other developers. Mm -hmm. Um, and so like, yeah, there, there's just no downside to getting in the habit of writing all the time about the work that you're doing. Um, yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. I think so too. I think that's, uh, such a good advice. And, um, there's, I think there's so many positive things that can come, uh, be that job opportunities, or maybe you have to jump on <laughs> one hoop less, uh, if you want to get, you know, a, a new job, um, mm -hmm. you, you know, you get better as, as you said, uh, in your communication skills, better at communicating with your colleagues and so on. So, yeah, I think this yeah. is a great, this is really a great, um, Inside. Thank you so much, Abdi, for. Oh, oh, oh! Yeah. I have one other thing yeah, on on that sure. on that note that I, I should include. Um, start building your your mailing list now. Mailing list, yeah. Yeah. Good thing. Yeah. Independent That's mailing like, list, I would say. You know, do that blog thing, and then yeah. slap. You know, go with with ConvertKit or something, and slap a, a a mailing list. Subscribe on that thing, and just start collecting that snowball now because that it takes a long time. But oh my gosh the opportunities that come out of having a, a good mailing list. Um, there's nothing else like it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I think that's a great ad, great addition to what you said before. So Afti, thank you so much for taking the time talking with me and uh, sharing everything with my listeners and uh, yeah, have a, have a good day. Thank you so much for this. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. This was another episode of the Software Engineering Unlocked podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please help me spread the word about the podcast. Send the episode to a friend via email, Twitter, LinkedIn, well, whatever messaging system you use, or give it a positive review on your favorite podcasting platform such as Spotify or iTunes. This would mean really a lot to me. So thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and I will talk to you in two weeks. Bye.